You know, Mr. President, we're uh, considering the uh, Shaheen Portman Energy Efficiency Bill. That's what I believe this legislation is called. And I think we got on to this bill on Monday. And here it is, late Thursday afternoon. And it's amazing that we haven't had a debate or a vote on a single amendment in three days. Now, we're done for the week, so we're not going to have any debate on any amendments or any votes tomorrow either. We're going to go the whole week without having been able to seriously consider the merits or problems with this bill and without being able to offer any ideas to improve or to change the underlying text. It's just unbelievable. But this is what's become routine here in the United States Senate. Now, I've offered four amendments, introduced four amendments that I'd like to debate, I'd like to have a vote on. I've co-sponsored four other amendments that my colleagues have offered. I think altogether Republicans have drafted and filed dozens of amendments. I don't know exactly how many, there's dozens. In part because we haven't considered an energy bill in this chamber in seven years. Things change in seven years. Lots of things change. And after seven years of not having a debate over energy policy in America, something that is so basic to our economy, so important to every single family, every single business, everybody, it might be a good idea to have a debate and to offer some amendments, and to have a discussion and have some votes. But that's not the way the Senate functions. Can't do it. Majority party, the majority leader just will not allow us to have amendments. That, this isn't terribly recent. Over the last 10 months, since July of last summer, the majority leader has permitted Republicans to have a grand total of eight amendment votes. Eight votes in 10 months. The Senate's virtually shut down. That's, that's what's happened, Mr. President. It just so happens that during that same period of time, the House Republicans who are in control of the House, they permitted the minority party to have 136 votes. Of course, the irony is that it's the House that has historically always operated under a kind of a martial law kind of approach where the majority totally dictates all terms. It always has. But during this 10-month period, they've had 136 votes permitted to the minority party. We've had eight, and none on this energy bill. None, not one. I, I truly don't understand why the majority party is so afraid of votes. What is so horrifying about casting a vote on an amendment, but apparently, apparently that's the case. I, I want to talk briefly about two of the amendments that I've offered that I would like to have a vote on. I'm not asking for an outcome, by the way. I accept that I don't have any right to expect any particular outcome, but I don't understand why we can't have the discussion, why we can't have the debate, why we can't have the vote. By the way, it's Thursday afternoon. By now, we could have processed dozens of amendments. Actually, Republicans, in the end, all we wanted was a handful. But, but here's one that I offered. It's Amendment 3037. It would prohibit the Department of Energy from issuing new energy efficiency mandates on residential boilers. Not very complicated. It's not the end of the world, one way or the other. But on the margins, I think this kind of thing matters a little bit to families. I'll tell you why. Residential boilers, we all have them. These are our hot water heaters. We've got them in our basements. We use them to heat water, to heat our house in some cases, to heat our water so we can take a hot shower. This is pretty common. We've all got them. Well, the Department of Energy is in their periodic process of reviewing the mandates that they impose on the energy efficiency standards for the boilers. And the only consideration in this review process is whether they will make the mandates more stringent than they are today, make them adhere to a tougher standard than the standard that they're forced to adhere to today. Well, I think it'd be better not to change the standard. That's my opinion. 
The reason I hold that view is because the problem with a more stringent energy efficiency requirement on these hot water heaters is it makes them more expensive. Uh, it doesn't matter much for really wealthy people, but if you're a middle income family or you're a low income family, it raises the cost of your home, it raises the cost of replacing a hot water heater, and there's a lot of folks that just can't afford to have an unnecessary additional cost added to it. And by the way, I don't think you need to force consumers to conserve energy. Everybody has an incentive to conserve energy because energy is not free. So people are perfectly happy to pay a little more for more energy efficiency for a product if they can recoup that added cost in the form of a lower energy bill over time. People get that. They'll make that decision. They'll do it voluntarily. And in fact, the only reason you need to mandate standards is if you want to force consumers to pay a bigger premium than what they can recoup. If, if you only want them to pay for what they can save in the future, they do it voluntarily. So to me, this is one of those annoying little government mandates that's not necessary, and it reduces consumers' choices, raises their costs, and I don't think it's a good idea, especially during difficult economic times now where median wages have been declining, not rising. I, I just don't think it's a good idea for the government to impose a new cost like this. And so I've got an amendment that would forbid the Department of Energy from ratcheting up the cost of, a, of an appliance that we have, that we all have in our homes. Now, I get the fact that not everybody agrees with me. That's fine. Some people do want to impose this added cost for their own reasons, and that's fine. What I don't understand is why we can't have the debate, why we can't have the discussion, and then have a vote. And then I either win or I lose, and we're done. But we don't do that. Apparently, the majority party is just not willing to allow Republican amendments. I have another amendment. Now, this one has bipartisan co-sponsorship. I have co-sponsors of uh, Senators Coburn, Flake, and finally, actually, it's Senator Coburn who introduced it initially. I'm a co-sponsor. What this would do, this amendment would eliminate the corn ethanol mandate from the renewable fuel standard. Now, what's that about? Well, existing law mandates that we take corn, convert it into ethanol, and then the law requires that that ethanol be mixed with the gasoline, and we all have to buy it when we fill up our tanks. Mr. President, you may be aware, we now burn over 40% of all the corn we grow in America, over 40% of it, we end up burning in our cars by turning it into ethanol and mixing it with our gasoline. Well, this was, there, there were good intentions when this mandate was initially created. Some people thought it would be good for the environment. Um, it turns out it's not. It's bad for the environment. And, and, and that's not just me saying this. The National Academy of Sciences, the Environmental Working Group, everybody acknowledges it increases carbon emissions. Now, we had members on the other side of the aisle thought that the issue of carbon in the atmosphere, CO2 releases, was so important that they were here around the clock in a, in a dramatic display of political theater to make this case. Well, here's an amendment that would reduce CO2 emissions because the ethanol requirement increases CO2 relative to where we'd be if it didn't exist. It, that's not the only problem with the ethanol mandate. It raises the price of filling up our tanks. This is expensive stuff. Having to mix it with ordinary gasoline raises the cost of driving. Everybody has to drive. So not only is it bad for the environment, but it's more expensive for every single family that operates a vehicle. That's not all it does. Because we're diverting 40% of all the corn we grow to our gas tanks, it's not available in our cereals or in the food that we feed to livestock. And so food prices are higher than they need to be, higher than they would otherwise be because of this mandate. That's not all. Everybody acknowledges that ethanol has a corrosive effect on engines. So it's doing damage to our engines, which shortens the life of the engines. Again, not that big a deal if you're extremely wealthy and you can just kind of burn through cars. But for 
the vast majority of the people that I represent, the cars are very expensive costs that they incur, and having a policy that systematically damages that very valuable asset doesn't make a lot of sense to me. There's yet another reason. These ethanol mandates can have very dire consequences on some of our oil refineries, and that can cost us jobs, and it threatens refineries in Pennsylvania. As a matter of fact, I got a letter from the Philadelphia AFL-CIO business manager, a fellow named Pat Gillespie, who wrote to me asking me to try to do something about this because it's threatening the jobs of the people he represents at the refineries where they work. I'm going to quote briefly from a portion of his letter. He says, quote, the impact of the dramatic spike in costs of the RIN credits, that's the system by which the EPA enforces the ethanol mandate, from four cents to one dollar per gallon will cause a tremendous depression in our refinery's bottom line in 2013. Of course, at the building trades, we need the refineries to maintain and expand jobs. He closed by saying, we need your help in this matter. Mr. President, I'm trying to help. I'm offering an amendment that would repeal the corn ethanol mandate here, together with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Now, again, I understand not everybody agrees with this. There are some people who like the ethanol mandate. They think it's a good idea to grow corn to end up burning it in our cars. Why can't we have this debate? Why can't we have a vote? Why can't we resolve these things on the Senate floor? But we don't. We spend the whole week waiting and wondering whether we might be allowed to have one or two amendments, only to find out, of course, as usual, we get none. And so another week goes by, nothing productive being done on the Senate floor, and legislation that could be a vehicle for a meaningful, robust debate about energy policy in America. I've just given two examples. We've got dozens of things we could be debating. We didn't insist on having all of them, but a handful of ideas? It's, it's shocking to me. It's shocking that we just can't allow the Senate to function, that Senator Reid insists that we can't have an open amendment process. It's, it's disturbing because, of course, historically, this was the body that, that did exactly that, had the open amendment, had the open debate. This was the, you know, I, I'm chuckling because it seems so odd now, but historically, the Senate was considered the world's greatest deliberative body because we would deliberate. The Senate used to do this. The, the way it used to operate is that the majority party would control the agenda, could set, decide what was on the floor, and that's fair enough. But then once the majority leader would decide what bill is on the floor, then it would be open for debate until essentially the body exhausted itself and members were finished offering amendments, and then you'd have a final passage vote. There's no such thing, nothing even remotely similar to that is happening today. Now, I know a number of my colleagues, including the distinguished senator who's in the chair at the moment, have served in the House. It's unbelievable to me that now for an extended period of time, the House is having much more robust debate and far more amendment votes by both the majority and the minority party than we're permitted to even consider in the Senate. Uh, this is a sorry state of affairs. Seven years since the last debate on energy policy, an energy efficiency bill comes to the floor and energy efficiency amendments are not permitted to have a discussion or a vote. That's what the Senate has come to. So, Mr. President, I would just urge my colleagues and urge the majority party in particular who control this body and urge the majority leader Allow the Senate to function. Allow us to actually have a debate. Allow us to have some amendments. It's actually not that excruciating to have a vote. And in a matter of a very short period of time, we could mow down lots of amendments and move on to the next important piece of legislation. Energy is a really, really important issue for our country, for our economy, for every consumer. And it deserves to have a more serious consideration than it's getting. I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum.